University. Please join me in welcoming Jerry Patterson. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Thank Good you. to see you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. So let's not beat around the bush. This is about beating around the bush, right? <laughs> I've been waiting to make that joke for four years. Um, <laughs> I'm speechless. For Are the you speechless? That's never happened before. Well, is this about him or is this about it? Is this about, I just don't like the cut of his coat, or is this a substantive issue? If the same work was being done by a different person, would you be running? Yes, him and it are the same thing. Well, but It's you, about performance, uh, not about personality. He seems to get under your fingernails a little bit. You seem not to like him very much, is that true? He's a very likable guy. Yeah. And when I met him and the several times I visited with him when he came to visit at the land office, I was impressed. Right. Very gregarious, uh, self-effacing, uh, you know, got a really good smile and I uh, thought he was going to do the right things and I've been disappointed. Right. And you were disappointed from the very beginning? No, not from the very beginning. Uh, you know, I had, there were early signs, the uh, press conference on the first hundred days that the press could not attend. I said, well, that's not the way to get the word out yeah. about what a good job you're doing. Uh, the mention that he had cleaned up contracting at the Texas General Land Office, and I'm sure there were improvements that could have been made. Well, we'll come, we'll come to that. Yeah, but, but, yeah. And, uh, yeah, okay, well, yeah. so we'll talk about that anymore. Yeah. Uh, no, 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 but, yeah. I, but, I, I, mean, but I hear you. But that, the, it, basic, like the, that. the basic yeah. issues are, you know, failure to understand the, the complexity of the office. This is not a partisan office. This is not an office that uh, you run on legislative, uh, you know, issues, or whether it's guns or abortion or any of that. This is an office where you have people who do things, yeah. and these things are technical. And, and the ob object is to perform and, and do the mission, and that has been, yeah. a, in, my, in my view, a, a, a relatively large failure. Now, when you came in after being a state senator, you had to learn on the job. Anybody who's not had that job has to learn on the job. Why are you not willing to cut him the same slack? Well, no, that's not exactly correct. And, and I am willing to cut him slack. You know, he, he, there's nothing wrong with knowing nothing unless you no, don't know that you know nothing and know nothings are your advisors. And that's exactly what it happened. So you I, believe Commissioner Bush is a know nothing and he's surrounded by know nothing. Exactly. And, and I will also tell you that your, I think your premise is maybe not completely accurate. When I became commissioner, I had been in the legislature for six years representing a coastal district. I had passed legislation having to do with the Veterans Land Board, right. uh, the Veterans Home. So I was not, but there was a lot of stuff. Well, you I understand, though, that the uh, stipulated, but the inner workings of a major state agency, even though it's a, a minor major in the sense of its size compared to some other state agencies, it is nonetheless a huge portfolio, and the inner workings of that agency and being the chief executive of that agency is different than being one of 31 state senators. Exactly. It right. is. But uh, nonetheless, there are some common characteristics. You have to sell. Right. You've got to be able to convince people that what you're doing is the right thing to do. Yeah. You've got to be able to go to the legislature and explain to them what's occurring and why it should be occurring or not occurring. Right. You've got to communicate, and you can't communicate if you hide. And I would ask you a question. Did, have you asked Commissioner Bush to do one of these? I have asked Commissioner Bush very frequently to do public events with us, and he has occasionally done public events with us, but he is hardly the only person in public office. I mean, look, you are a, you are a unicorn being chased by a chupacabra in terms of your willingness to, to talk to the press as an elected official. You are a rare species. There are a lot of people in public office, well, not I, just him. I don't him. think it's a rare species if you... I could uh, name people who are worse at that than he is. Uh, well, that may be the case, but he's not, he's not on the ballot right now for land commissioner. We, we've had 12 candidate forums. Yeah. Not a one has he attended. And we've had, uh, you know, the, the, the press interviews, the, the editorial board interviews. He doesn't attend those either. He doesn't right. fill out questionnaires. He's a hideout candidate. It's where's George? Right. And people deserve better than that. Let, let, let me kind of come at this question of why you're running uh, a, a little differently. Are you running to do something or are you running to stop something? I'm running to fix what needs fixing and retire once again. I had have, I have right. no interest in being on the ballot ever again. Right. And as you know, I suspect I tried to recruit somebody that had some name ID or money or both right. to run against him, and that was not successful. So I and said, so well, you said, me. well, step up. Yeah. That's basically what yeah, you want. I, I mean, I had, right. I had a good life. I'm retired. Right. I was doing things I liked. Because you understand, when people retire from jobs and then the next person comes in, occasionally, the, this was Ross's phrase to me yesterday, it's kind of like, I sold a guy my house and he painted the house a different color. I'm pissed. Well, that would be a wrong premise. That is not. That is not. That is not. That is not the case in this complete, case. That's complete. BS. It's much. It's much I more. I wish substantive. I was yeah. here praising George P. Bush. Yeah. And supporting him in a re-election effort. But I don't have. Don't take my word for it. Look. Look at every single press story is about some screw up at the land office, and the screw ups occur because 
you know, you don't have good help there. And, 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 and in fairness to you, many of those stories have happened not prior to your announcing, but after your announcing. They, so they, many they, of them they, have. They weren't, the, people, they weren't the impetus necessarily. Uh, the, the, right. the, well, you know, the, the pre people start paying attention when you're in an election, you've got a hotly contested primary, but those right. stories started within his first six months. Let's talk about the Alamo. Uh, I, I noted when your logo uh, for your campaign came out that it featured the Alamo, and I thought to myself, I know that the Alamo is part of the portfolio of the land office, but when I think of the land office, I think about veterans, I think about energy, I think about education. You seem to be putting all your chips on that square. That is what the public is interested in right now. The public in the main or a small subset of a small subset? I wonder how pervasive is the I, I Alamo issue out in the public in the main? It's, well, in the Republican primary, it's very pervasive, and I frankly think it's expanded beyond the Republican primary. I mean, you, 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 what can you talk about at the land office that has any sizzle or has any public interest or gets their, or gets their interest, and yeah. the Alamo is that thing. Yeah. And, of course, if you're on the coastal parts of Texas and you've got 52 inches of rain in Houston, it's hard. that's another issue. I mean, right. and, and those, are, those, por those issues are in, our, in the land office portfolio because they were given to the land office because when I... I and the other folks, some of them here, people who made even me look good, when we were there, we were the Ghostbusters agency of Texas government. You got a problem at the Alamo? What are you going to do with it? Give it to Parks and Wildlife right. or Texas Hysterical Commission? No, you give it to the General Land Office. You got a problem with Hurricane Ike recovery with two agencies that aren't doing a good job? You give it to the Land Office. We were the folks that got it. Done. You were the cleanup crew. Clean up, start up, whatever, right. yeah. Well, uh, what's your issue with Bush and, and Alamo? Is it, you know, so he made a decision to part ways with the daughters. You had a good relationship with the daughters when you were running the land office. Is it that? Was that the, no, is that the no. origin of that, this? You know, it, it, the manner in which he parted ways with the daughters was a disaster. It ended up in litigation between the land office and the DRT. The DRT won on all counts. And the land office paid their the DRT's uh, attorney's fees, mm -hmm. and, and that you know the, the circumstance that existed after the daughters were no longer managing the Alamo when, when Bush noticed gave them notice that they're going he was going to terminate the contract. Okay, fine, a little bad blood there, but the daughters remained at the library and they were running the Alamo Resource Center library. It was yeah. a perfect match where they could do things and, and, and take advantage of their skill sets with the land office help, and he screwed that up. Had, had you been a land commissioner during this period, you would not have parted ways with the daughters? Uh, I, would have, I would have certainly not sued them over a collection of dubious ownership and kicked them out of the... I would certainly have not padlocked the doors on the Alamo Resource Center Library so when they came to work on Monday morning, and I would certainly not have unlawfully and criminally hacked into their computers. No, right. I, that's not the way to get those folks on your side. Right, that, but that, that seems to me to be a process argument. I'm wondering, is there a substantive dis d dispute that you have with, with Commissioner Bush about the decision to part? I mean, it sounds like he, you think he handled it badly, hear that, but, but for the, on the substance of it, could you argue with the substance of making the decision to part ways I can with argue the with the substance of making decision to part completely and blow it up at the end. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the daughters at that point in time, it's my belief, were actually not all that happy about the arrangement with the land office. Yeah. And the daughters, you know, the daughters, I'm, I'm not sure that were unhappy with changing that relationship. But when you stick the blade in and twist it a right. little bit, and then you eliminate the help of an organization that saved the Alamo in 1905, and then you completely turned them against you when you could be using them as allies instead right. of enemies. This was 2015 that he parted ways with the daughters, correct? Yeah, I think notice was in March of 15. Correct? Right. So if the if if you if as you just said the daughters were unhappy with the relationship with the land office, he'd only been in office for two months. That must mean they were unhappy with the land office when you ran it. I, I think they may have been. Yeah, yeah, I think they may have been because uh, you know some of the. And, and, of course, the happy daughters or unhappy daughters is a function of who the uh, president and general of the daughters is at that time. And one of the issues in, in working with the daughters is that president and general changes every two years. Yeah. So that's a, that's a, a substantive issue of, of their organization, their right. heritage organization. So there were problems in the, in, the, uh, in the relationship, but I will tell you that the president and general of the daughters, at the time I was running the Alamo, Karen Thompson, has endorsed me and knows about the relationship we had yep. when we were working together. Even if we had some rocky road at, at, the, at the outset. She, of she's still for you. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So a lot has been made of this audit, uh, a draft of which was leaked to a couple members of the press, uh, uh, assessing the, the status of the 
land offices, management of the Alamo, uh, the, the takeaways, the financial information and accounting of the Alamo Complex Fund did not comply with state requirements. These are all quotes from the draft audit. Not all contract requirements to operate the Alamo are being met. Controls over budgeting, expenditures, contracting, and reconciliation should be strengthened. It sounds like basically there are concerns about transparency that is, doesn't do justice to the fullness of the audit. There were concerns about the nonprofits that were created right. after I left. Now, you created a non you, you were I in, created a nonprofit when that, you were there. That nonprofit will remain when, when I'm right. the next commissioner. So the, the notion of running the Alamo in the universe of a nonprofit coming into existence, that all is not, the premise of that is not bad because you No, did, the, the premise of that is bad. You said running. We're yeah. not the, the what's the problem now is there's a nonprofit running the Alamo. The Alamo endowment, which is what you created created, was not for the purpose of managing it. No, it had one sole purpose and that right. was to raise tax deductible contributions right. for the Alamo. That's all its purpose was. So, so having a nonprofit in existence to run the Alamo. To run the Alamo is the specific beef that you have, and apparently that the... the and as well, if you yeah. saw the hearing on December 5th of right. 17. Well, there were, and, a bi and it was bipartisan elected officials who complained. Uh, yeah, you know, I mean, because they Democrats called it convoluted. And they, yeah. they spoke on December 5th in that Senate finance hearing right. to the exact same things that are in that uh, draft audit right. that the commissioner should have known about. And during that hearing, you know, he, uh, you know, whatever, deer in the headlights, he right. should have known about it. And frankly, it should have been corrected. Yeah. You've got folks in that 501c3, which, which was originally the Alamo Complex Management 501c3, name was changed in October to the Alamo Trust. Alamo Trust. We've got employees being employed by that Alamo Trust solely for the purpose of being not on the FTE count at the Texas General Land Office. And, it, and, and that's an issue. I want to come to the administration of the agency in a second, but you have criticized Commissioner Bush for reducing the staff at the agency to basically look good for having done exactly. so. Exactly. And you Precisely. believe that what he's doing is is retaining more employees than he's claiming publicly by routing them through this other entity. Absolutely. Yeah. The uh, uh, the question of the uh, of transparency is one because the audit was an internal audit that it has not been released yet, and so the question is, you know, if if the, these findings have been have have been committed to paper, put it out. Well, right? it's in a draft form. It's in a draft form. As long form. as it's in draft form, it's not subject to disclosure. Right. So it's been in the draft form since September. Do you have any idea how the draft got out? Uh, no. You have anything to do with the draft? You or your campaign have anything to do with the draft? Are we going to find out later that somehow people loyal to you in the agency or your campaign in some way orchestrated the release of this draft? Uh, you're not going to find that out. Does that mean Maybe. it happened? Is that yeah. what? <laughs> That means I wanted to give you a, a line. That's, that means I wanted to. That, that was, I wanted to give you a line. No, yeah. we didn't have anything to, to do. You with had nothing to do with it. We're releasing the draft. Commissioner Bush's uh, uh, office team says that the draft that was leaked has been altered in some way to make the draft look worse, <laughs> or for him to look worse and his management of it look worse. Do you believe that? No. If it was altered, why didn't he sell, tell us what was altered? Have you? But you know, yeah. they don't even call it a draft. It's a memo now. I mean, it's all about obfuscation and talking points. Yeah. But if it's been altered, tell us what was altered. Right. And again, you'd have nothing if it if it had been changed in any way before it was released. You and your campaign had nothing to do with that. My, our campaign has never touched that draft. Right. So this is totally independent of your of your operation. Yeah. Okay. Um, Unless I can take the credit for it to my benefit. Do you want to take the credit for it to your benefit? <laughs> Um, you put a radio, you, you released, a, uh, put a release out in the last couple of days that had the audio of th a few radio ads that you're putting yep. on now as connected with the campaign. One of them is specifically related to the Alamo. And there were two principal issues that you criticized Commissioner Bush on, uh, and his management of the Alamo on in this ad. One is the removal of the cenotaph. Correct. Can you explain what your issue is with the removal of the cenotaph? My understanding is that the city owns the cenotaph. That's correct, they do. Right? So when you criticize Bush for wanting to remove the cenotaph, my understanding from the from the other side of this is we could remove the cenotaph if we want to. This is it's it's the city's property. There is property. a plan that has been signed off on by the Texas General Land Office yeah. and the city of San Antonio that calls for moving the cenotaph, also known as the Alamo Defenders Monument, away from and out of sight of the Alamo. I oppose that. Well, my understanding is that that decision has not been made, and that there are three <laughs> options on the table. <laughs> one of which, well, if you it, look, I I tried to do some backup on this. You know, I heard your ad. I made some phone calls. What I'm being told is that the decision has not been made and that there are three options for the location of the cenotaph, one of which is leave it in place. That's news to me. Leave it in place is news to me. And it's just, we have an ever-evolving position. 
Uh, I mean, when asked the question with some specificity, Commissioner, where will you put the cenotaph? That was asked by your friend, Michael Quinn Sullivan, in an interview in front of the Alamo. My bestie. Yeah. yeah. Uh, he, Bush responded when asked, where will you put the cenotaph? As long as I'm commissioner, the cenotaph will always stand. That's not an answer. Right. You know, take a, take a position. Well, but You're so, right. So, yeah. But, well, if, if you go to the website that Commissioner Bush has put up to answer questions about the Alamo, one of which is related to the cenotaph, it very explicitly says three things. It says... The decision has not been made. It says that the cenotaph will either remain in place, it will be put at the location of the old south gate, or it will be uh, relocated to a funeral pyre uh, to, to where, where the defenders were buried. All of that is evolving because he has an opponent. Just as the, just as the disclosure and the newfound transparency of the Alamo Trust decision, which occurred just a few days after I filed on December 11th of right. last year and made an issue of it, just as the Hurricane Harvey recovery contracts to start the emergency shelter-in-place housing were signed four days after I made an you issue of it. You think it's all about you? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And you think that had he not had a serious challenge in the primary, he would not have stepped away from his position? On, I, I don't on, know. You know. No, he wouldn't have done, any, he wouldn't have done anything because yeah. he's afraid to make decisions. Decisions right. have consequences. When you make a decision, people, some people don't like them. So, so, so let's assume that, that Commissioner Bush is to be taken at his word and that the Senate Taft would either the remain in place, which presumably you support, or would be moved either to the location of the old south gate just outside or to the location of the funeral pyre where the defenders were buried. What they're talking about doing is restoring it and then adding names of additional Alamo Absolutely. defenders. Absolutely. Great idea. Restore you, it and add names. Yes, you, you're for that. restoring it. You're for adding names of Alamo defenders. Do either of those two locations pass muster with you, Commissioner? The, uh, the moving it away to a rumored which much con uh, historical controversy about where the funeral pyres were to a location that may or may not be a funeral pyre is not acceptable to me. Leaving it in place is the best choice. I would consider moving it just outside, not at the location of the South Gate, but just, just outside. outside yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, that may be, but you know, the cenotaph has been there since 1940. Right. Whether you can structurally move it or not is subject to question, and there are no, to my knowledge, engineering studies right. or analysis about whether it can be moved. I initially was a proponent of moving it just out the South Gate. If you look at an aerial photo of the footprint of the Alamo and you, you put the cenotaph there in that courtyard, it's not very large. And additionally, if you go to Gettysburg, you go to Antietam or Sharpsburg or right. wherever you go, there are monuments all over the battlefield. It's present where it is, is not a negative. You know, the other part of this, uh, Commissioner, I mean, I, peace on all this. I mean, you fight over where the location of the Senate should be fine. The second part of this in the radio ad is you referred in the radio ad to a politically correct cleansing Yes. Of Texas history. Yes. You talked about monuments being removed. Yes. You made him sound like President Fenvis removing Confederate statues in the middle of the night. Do you know? Do this, you, it, it, this is not a Confederate statue issue. This is, I mean, you're, you're making it sound like, or you're at least trying to tie this to that whole debate. Is I this am. debate that debate? I am, and it is. Why? It what's is. what's politically correct about the, moving the, the, the Senate? Historical revision of monuments is not limited to Confederate monuments. We all we know that uh, uh, Bowie was a slave, not only a slave owner, a slave trader. We know that uh, Travis owned slaves. So, and there is a movement. If you look at if you look at the discourse from the left, you will talk. You will see you know, maligning Texas heroes because they were just fighting in 1836. But what does moving the cenotaph from one location because to another have to do with tired. cleansing history? It has everything to do with it. We're sick and tired of moving monuments. And if you note that Commissioner Bush talked about the Confederate Heroes Day as a slap in the face, then you begin to wonder, well, if asked the question about removing Confederate monuments, what would his answer be? And I submit to you, it would be he's okay with that. But there, is, no nothing, but there is nothing about moving the cenotaph that is akin to the, to the fight over moving, conf, removing is, Confederate there statues, is there? Is there is everything to do with retroactive revision and politically correct cleansing of our history. But, what's, but last time, what is politically correct about moving the cenotaph from its current location to the, just outside the south Because gate? it's out of sight. But you said you supported moving it just outside the south gate yourself. It's not out of sight outside the south gate. You right. can look at it. So as a matter of fact, so matter matter fact when yeah. you enter the Alamo, and, and, and the, the plan is designed as I think So you believe is. that's what he wants to do? He wants to move history out of sight? I believe that's there's a substantial to. question about right. his motives and his, and his, and right. his fealty to, to Texas history, yes. Let's get to the Harvey question, which has been the second big drum you've been beating against Commissioner Bush. What should he have done differently? What did he do that he shouldn't have done? What didn't he do? 
that he should have done? And how do you disengage the responsibilities of the GLO that it's supposed to dispatch from the responsibilities of the federal government? It's complicated when a situation it like this It is complicated place. except for two things. Partial Repair, Emergency Power and Shelter, acronym PREPS, and Direct Assistance for Limited Housing Recovery, acronym DOLLAR. Those two things are dramatically uncomplicated in a very complicated disaster recovery world. You know, on September 23rd of 2017, FEMA gave the responsibility for the PREPS program to the Texas General Land Office, and nothing, nothing was done. PREPS would, would allow up to $20,000 to be spent on making a house habitable. You go in there, you tear out the carpet, you tear out the drywall, you make sure the plumbing, the AC, the house is dried in, that it can be lived in. It's like camping at home. The advantage of preps their people are back in their home kids are going to school mom and dad are available for community for work so that preps program was licensed to the land office on the 23rd of september 2017 and they had done zero preps and two dollar by in four months later and that was not a mistake that was a conscious decision by the general land office and by whoever there not to do that because it required a 10 percent state or local match which would probably come out of the rainy day fund and in order to be a fiscal conservative we're not going to tap the rainy day fund yeah. that's just pretty damn criminal so you would have tapped the rainy day fund i mean i i think of you as, as a fiscal conservative before being a fiscal conservative it, it, this, was cool this has so suddenly now you're no longer a fiscal conservative this has nothing to do with fiscal yeah. conservative rainy day fund 52 inches right it if rains you can't, it actually you, rains exactly yeah and that's what the fund is for. And a decision was made not to use that fund because you would look fiscally not conservative. But, but who, else, who besides Commissioner Bush was opposed to tapping the rainy day fund immediately as opposed to down the road I'm not for the for purposes Governor. of this? But hold on a second. Governor Abbott opposed it. Lieutenant Governor Patrick opposed it. You know, uh, every conservative elected official at the legislature opposed it. I mean, the reality is you're to the left of all of those people on this issue. I don't think so at all. I don't know. It, it, they Isn't it, it true that Governor Abbott said we don't need to touch That has to nothing to do with left-right. That has to do with the decision that they later changed. Well, what they've said is we're going to access the rainy day fund, but we're going to do it retro, sort of after the fact to pay ourselves back. Well, then you could have used when, when we did Hurricane Ike, we took money out of various other accounts that we were later reimbursed for by the federal government. So talk about that. So you tout your response as land commissioner on Dolly and Ike specifically as a sign of how you ran the agency well and, and that what people should expect from you should you be reelected to this job. What was different in terms of what you did then well, there was versus what he difference. did now? There was a dramatic difference. Yeah. When I took over, it was about four months after Hurricane Ike, and we were not responsible for emergency housing. Commissioner Bush, is, is we, t we were responsible for long-term housing and infrastructure recovery when I was there. Commissioner Bush was given the additional duty of emergency housing. There's yeah. a difference there, so you can't make a direct comparison. But I will tell you, when we took over that program from two other state agencies because it was not being run well, and the governor says, I want you to take this over because you all have the resources to do it, right. we made mistakes. We screwed things up. But it was because we made mistakes. It wasn't because we made a conscious decision not to use the rainy day fund, which was not in play at the time. And I will also tell you that the reason that this Harvey has disaster recovery has been a disaster is in large part because in the idea of being a small government fiscally conservative Republican, within six months of Bush taking over, the disaster recovery division that we had created that by that time was doing was a pretty good job, 12 people were gone, 12 key people. Six, six were fired and six, you know, retired or, or left before they could be fired. And that's a great thing to do, the, to be fiscally conservative, hire younger people, less salary, you know, do all that stuff. It's a great thing to do. It's a gamble. And when you have 52 inches of rain in Houston, it's a gamble that failed. Yeah. That, so, uh, again, coming, I want to come to the administration thing in a second, but I want to ask you about the federal government's response. Where people are, I've been to the coast and talked to people on the coast, mayors of some of the communities in the affected areas, and when you ask them about the biggest problem that they've had in the recovery, they talk about FEMA. They do, because FEMA is an They don't talk about they GLO, they don't talk about Rainy Day Fund, they don't talk about the state response, they talk about the federal response. They say, yes, the federal government says they're going to cover something like 90% of the cost of the rebuild, that the federal government's going to be in here, we're going to solve the problem, but that the lag time and the federal government actually providing the resources, that's really the issue. The complicated nature of the federal response is the issue. They actually praise state officials for the response that they've done. Well, they, if, if, if they don't praise state officials about, about temporary housing recovery, except for the one that got no. the house. Now, but let me, more, let me tell more, you. Bro, more broadly, I, I okay. stipulate, yeah. Okay. Right, but, but let me say why yeah. that is. Yeah. FEMA is an identifiable name 
and everybody knows what FEMA does, and they've known that for 20 or more years, 30 years, whatever. Right. GLO disaster recovery is not something people associate with it. So FEMA is the, is the low-hanging fruit, the bright, shiny object to complain. And, and absolutely, FEMA, the problem with FEMA, and I work with them quite a bit, is that they will spend $10 to save a dollar. You know, they're so afraid of waste, fraud, and abuse, they'll spend $10 to prohibit $1 of waste, fraud, and abuse. Waste, fraud, and abuse can be actually more efficient and less expensive than FEMA oversight. Yeah. You know, it, 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 they have checkers checking checkers, auditors auditing. Auditors, it is an unbelievable right. bureaucracy. Right. So on this question of cutting the bureaucracy, let's get to this. You brought up a couple times the administration of the agency. So Commissioner Bush touted and touts the fact that the staff of the agency is uh, some percentage smaller now than it was when, when you ran it. Again, I think of you as a small government conservative. Back before the Freedom Caucus was in existence, back before there was a Tea Party, you were preaching what we now understand are the sort of basic tenets of small government conservatism. I would think that, that, that reducing the size of government would be something you'd be for. False economies can occur. Let me give you an example. Right okay. now in the Veterans Land Board Loan Processing Department, there are three vacant FTEs to do loan processing and loan origination. And we're saving money. We have three vacant FTEs. The problem with that premise is, is that these veterans' loans come out of tax-exempt bonds issued by the Veterans Land Board. Yeah. In order to retire that debt, you have to turn over, you have to expedite loans, you have to have a certain loan volume. So you can actually cost yourself money by not filling three FTEs. So without, without people in the jobs, you can't actually do what you need to do well, in to, the case, to perform the functions of the office. But specifically to your fiscal responsibility point, you can actually, if, if you do not have sufficient loan volume, you won't be able to retire that bond indebtedness in, in the appropriate schedule. Right. That will cost you money. can actually be less fiscally conservative exactly. in that case. You know, and, 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 and Commissioner Bush has reduced the agency, and I'm quite, I'm quite sure that there are some people there that maybe, you know, could be doing something else. And I understand that. But I will tell you, again, he's, he, he talks about whatever the percentage is. You know, he I, think, reduced, I think it's 15%. He talks, talks about 15%. Well, add 75 into that mix. 75 people who are employed by the Alamo Trust at the Alamo and being paid by state dollars. Then you think the number is not an accurate number. Exactly. Yeah. You know, so the response of Commissioner Bush at the time that this initially happened, the redu reduction of the staff, and up through now is the agency under Jerry Patterson was bloated in terms of staff. And beyond that, Commissioner Patterson, like a lot of other state agency heads, gave out bonuses indiscriminately to people on the land office staff. In fact, according to reporting in 2015, it was six and a half million dollars in bonuses, including a million two hundred thousand in bonuses to staff in the last few months when you were running for another office. You know, Commissioner Miller, who was here last week, was criticized for the size of his bonus pool in the first nine months. Other state agencies have been criticized. There have been hearings about the degree to which agency heads have begun to use these one-time uh, bonus dollars and that ultimately the cost of the state is too much. What's your response to that? My response is I gave bonuses, and if I'm commissioner, I'll do it again. I won't people... No apologies. Uh, well, I mean, there may be some in there that maybe didn't deserve, but, but the, the whole premise, and you'll notice I'm not criticizing Bush on bonuses, you know, because we had people who wanted to go to work and by virtue of that did a very good job. Yeah. The people that are there now are hunkered down, shuffling their feet, afraid to make a decision because they're afraid they're going to be fired. You create a good work with a good work environment, with a motivated workforce, you get better productivity. We gave people bonuses based upon their performance. Yeah. And I, you know, I would do that again. You would do, you don't, so you don't think that something inconsistent with being a fiscal conservative on the one hand, but giving away more than $6 million dollars in bonuses. It's compensation. Right. Bonus, once salary, just, once compensation. Just, once just raised their salaries. A bonus, salary, well, because that's something that's there and it stays there. A right. bonus is based upon an annual review of performance. Yeah. And it's merit. And it's merit. So every one of those bonuses you, you can justify on the grounds of merit. Yes, did then, can do it now. And would do it again, as you say. I would do, I would, yes, I would have a bonus program. There's Perform. nothing wrong with a bonus program. You've been critical of uh, Commissioner Bush on ethics. And let's just say that there's been a bunch of press reporting in the Tribune and elsewhere that have raised questions about some things connected to the administration of, President, of, a, of Commissioner Bush's office. But you have specifically been critical of the fact that um, uh, he awarded contracts and he received co contributions from f f folks to whom he had awarded contracts. Th that is not uh, illegal, right? No, it's not illegal. Campaign Never. contributions from, I mean, no, no law prohibits employees of, of government contractors from making contributions, correct? It's not illegal. No. Right. 
So what's never, your issue? Never what, said it was. What's your issue with? It? The issue is you've uh, signed a contract, and three days later you get thirty thousand dollars in contributions from the ex executives of that. So from your perspective, it's all perception. It's it's, it's optics. Uh, it is optics, and it's particularly interesting because there are certain people that Commissioner Bush will not accept uh, contributions from, and because he might be tainted by something they did in the past. And it's it's disingenuous, you know. I'll 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 take contributions from people I don't know, but people who who really you know would like to contribute and they're not allowed to because they've done something in the past. One of them in particular, uh, well, I don't I don't want to go in the in the particular name because that's not fair to that person. But but anyway, so it, it's it's uh, it, the optics are bad at a time when he needs good, not bad. Do you know optics. Do you know anything specifically about any of the contractors, the one in question whose employees gave contributions to Commissioner Bush, or any other contracting relationships that the land office has entered into where something a, a bad happened or where the contractor was not the right person? Can, can you do more than ding him on the perceived conflict? Uh, yes, but I'm not doing it now. Why? Well, we still have time. What, are you going to drop a bomb on them later? Is that your point? It's a, it's, no, it's the October surprise. No, I'm, I'm, I'm just I'm yanking your chain. You don't, but I mean, do you have... I, I'm do, yanking do, your chain. No, do you have no, something specific? No, and answer your question. Yeah. And to answer your question, yeah. no, I don't know of anything illegal or unethical that Commissioner Bush has done as it relates to campaign contributions, and I never said that right. there was. But, you'll, said, but, you'll, work, but you'll work the on. perceived conflict to the fare thee well, though, if you can, for this. Uh, uh, what I will tell you is yeah. that if I had, I would not have accepted contributions three days after that, knowingly. Maybe he wasn't knowingly, right. but nonetheless, it's not about whether you knowingly did or did not do. It's about it happened on your watch, and this is politics. Right. And I would submit to you that, you know, that... <laughs> The, the honor among thieves is equally uh, missing between he and I, if not more so on his part. I mean, I just found out today that I voted for Hillary Clinton. Somebody told me there's a radio ad saying I voted for Hillary Clinton. Well, I'll, I'll ask you who you <laughs> voted for in a second. You can decide whether you want to admit to voting for Hillary Clinton or whether you want to decide not to tell me, because that seems to be the, the habit of some elected officials these days, not to tell us who they voted for. Um, uh, were you not in a conversation about your own contracting policies some years ago at the land office when you ran it. I went back and found a July 2015 audit by the state auditor that dinged you during your tenure for mistakes in how you handled six million in contracts over the last few years in office, failing to address conflicts of interest, using untrained contract managers, throwing away invoices, vastly underestimating project costs. He's had his audit questioning his management you had your audit questioning your management and specifically related to contracting. Since we're talking you know, about difference, Mr. Bush's contracting, should we not be talking about your contracting? I'd be policies? happy to talk about my contract. The difference is my audit was released and known to the public. Well, your audit was done by the state auditor. Exactly. It was not an internal audit. But yeah. nonetheless, it was available to the public and we didn't try to have it. But, but again, here's the problem with that audit. When you, and audits are good things. When you have an audit, then you look at their findings and then you respond. Right. These findings had no response. I'll give you an example. One of the things they dinged us on, or dinged, whatever, it happened during my watch, dinged him, dinged me on, was the fact that we hired a, a contractor with two, two, two on-site employees. They weren't employees, they were contract to do a royalty audit of our royalty receipts, to compare our royalty receipts versus the comptroller's uh, severance tax reports and, and the Railroad Commission's production reports to see if we'd missed any royalty. Instead of uh, the, the audit dinged us, they, should, they could, could have hired two employees yeah. instead of a contract. The contract was more expensive. Okay, it was. But you know what? We made, we identified several million dollars in unpaid royalties. And frankly, if you hire people and then you fire them to, to a year later, it was about a year they, they were in this audit, I think it's better practice to hire an outside contractor and not a full-time equivalent employee. So you, so you challenge some of the findings in I the I would have challenged in, all in, the findings. The Actually, audit. I wouldn't have challenged all the findings. There probably some of them were perfectly valid. I right. don't know. But I, will, I do tell you this, that the fact that we hired a firm to do a royalty audit and we could have hired, uh, I think it was two FTEs instead at lesser cost, is a bogus issue. We got the job done and we didn't have to fire people and have an unemployment claim or have a dissatisfied workforce when you, okay, I'm going to hire you for a year, then you're going to fire. I'm not going to tell you I'm going to fire you. So I stand but, but, by But that. again, the difference between the audit of the Alamo management and the audit of your office that I'm referring to is that one, the latter, 
the audit of your office was a state audit and it was released publicly. Exactly. And your concern is that we don't yet really know what the specifics are. And we of the, won't and the until after March 7th or May 27th. Until you think after the primary. Let me ask you about one of the big issues. I don't want to talk politics at the end here, but I want to ask you about one of the big issues in the land office portfolio, and that's education, specifically money that is generated for the permanent school fund and the available school fund. Yesterday, uh, earlier this week, I should say, uh, two members of the State Board of Education, David Bradley and Tom Maynard, released a, an open letter to George P. Bush. There was something that looked like the state of Texas seal on it, but it's not an official letter. And in fact, I called Mr. Maynard last night and asked him, are you releasing this letter in your official capacity through the State Board of Education? And he basically admitted, no, we're not. This is not an official thing. Mr. Bradley is an endorser of your campaign. He was already endorsed, endorsed your campaign prior to this letter being released. Mr. Maynard, from what I can tell, is not. Mr. Bradley is also a contributor to your campaign. This letter dings Mr. Bush. Before we get into the specifics of it, did you ask the, the Bradley and Maynard to write this letter? I did not. And what difference does it make who wrote the letter? Is the premise factually accurate? And it is. Well, apparently, uh, so what, I w what I've been able to determine and to push back on the Bush, uh, uh, from the Bush team on this has been circulated in the press is that for the four years Bush has been in, he has generated, or the office has generated, $4.3 billion for the purpose of the permanent school and the available school fund. And what they say is in the 12 years that you were in office, you only generated about $8 billion. And that if they do the math, they say, if they do the math, Bush has generated at a time when the price of oil was significantly lower than when you were in office, that the Bush team has generated at the GLO more than double the amount of money for education annually than you did while you were in office. They're answering the question with another answer to another question. So I'm you say not it's making, not apples to apples. Uh, uh, absolutely not. Right. You understand. There's such a thing as uh, generating income to deposit in the permanent school fund. Right. Now, that's what their response is about. They say we have generated, right, specifically. Uh, 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 yeah, but that's not even the issue. Well, Mr. Maynard, says it's, the issue. Maynard, Maynard issue. says it's the issue because the campaign uh, ad, or the campaign mailer that they're talking about said we contributed more than $4 billion. Maynard to public, says to public, to public schools. And Maynard says the issue is they're using the word contributed to public schools, but then when they respond to the letter, they talk about generating revenue which Maynard says are two different things. Exactly. Yeah. We have a permanent school fund, we have an available school fund. You don't send money to public schools by making money for the PSF. You only send money to public schools by dispersing money from the State Board of Education portfolio or the General Land Office portfolio to the available school fund. They said they gave $4 billion to public schools. They gave $300 million. That's just a fact. So, so whose decision is it? Once that revenue, you don't argue with the notion that $4.3 billion came in the door, generated to go into the I assume that's fund. correct. I don't okay. know. Whose decision is it, uh, Commissioner, at that point, once that money is generated, to then take that money and bring it over to actually go to the school? It's schools? a decision of the State Board of Education by, actually, the State Board of Education has a legislative, or maybe it's a constitutional mandate to make a certain payment every biennia to the, to the available school fund. The land office has no mandate. The land office has the discretion to disperse to the available school fund or not. Right, and so two questions on that. So if the, if the State Board of Education did not move that money over, since you say it's their responsibility, how can no. you blame him for not doing it? No, I, I didn't say it was their responsibility. I'm, I'm saying they have the responsibility to manage their portfolio and make a disbursement. Right. And the land office has a responsibility to manage their portfolio, and they have the discretion to make or not make so a he, disbursement. So you, you say that then he can't rightfully claim having contributed that money because it's not really his to contribute. No. Oh, okay, yeah. Whatever the number is, it's four billion is what he four, claims. Four point three billion, yes. Well, no, you're talking about the revenue to the PSF. Right? Yes, yes. Okay. Well, what what he claimed was that there was he contributed four billion dollars to public schools. Right. That, that was the only, that was the actual phrase. That yes. was that can only be done by to making the, disbursement to, to the, the available, available school, school fund. fund. Right. He made a disbursement of three hundred million dollars, not four billion dollars, and that's right. false. And all this other chatter is because they're trying to move the subject onto something else that I'm not challenging them on. Right. So it's, it's Maynard and Bradley who are doing it, not you. Well, no, I'm challenging them now. Yeah. I have knowledge of it. I'm challenging them now. Right. It's not about who did it. It's about whether that, that representation is factually it's accurate, factually correct. and it is. Um, l let me ask you about the last time you ran. So you decided to run in 2014 for lieutenant governor, walk away from the land office. 
you know, I, I'm tempted to ask you, what about finishing fourth out of four in the Republican primary? Go tells ahead you and that ask the, me. Tells you that the public wants you back. Um, if I finished fourth out of four in a primary, I might think that that means maybe I was done in office. Uh, I thought it was. Yeah. That was my intent. That right. was my, uh, I was quite happy with being done in office. Why did you run for lieutenant governor? I mean, I, I interviewed you at the time, yeah. actually, and I know you talked about what you wanted to do. You were dissatisfied with David Dewhurst, but you had Todd Staples and Dan Patrick both in that race. If you were dissatisfied just with David Dewhurst, you could have decided not to run well, and just support either decided, of those guys. You know, David Dewhurst initially was not in the race and later decided to get in the race. I right. was dissatisfied with David Dewhurst, as were many, and I thought I could do better. Were you dissatisfied with Dan Patrick's campaign at the time? With his campaign? Or with, with what he wanted to do as lieutenant governor? Obviously, you thought you would do better. Yeah, I thought I would do better. Right. Have you been satisfied with the lieutenant governor since he's been in office? Do you now think to yourself, actually, this was a good outcome for yeah, Texas? Yeah, I've been satisfied with some things and, and not particularly satisfied with others. Name something that you've been satisfied I, with. I knew you were going to ask me that because yeah. I, I can tell you there has to be something but, uh, that you're happy with uh, or, or unhappy with. Uh, he's been... Uh, you've never not been, had an opinion about anything. Come on, well, man. Well, you know, uh, he's, he's been consistently in favor of, of the Second Amendment, and right. I appreciate that. And he's been consistently pro-life. I, I appreciate that. Uh, I, I, will, I will tell you that, for, for example, on the bathroom bill, uh, you know, I would support a bathroom bill. And, and I, I think I might have been able to pass one because it wouldn't have been about me. So I think it's not. I think. I think Dan. What does that mean? Uh, you know, if you, uh, it has to do with presentation. You know, it has to do with presentation. Sometimes uh, Dan's presentation work would work better than mine. Sometimes mine would work. So you ding him on style points, basically. Sometimes, but yeah. not always. Yeah. You know. It, you know, but I'm generally, not, you're satisfied with his performances with Governor. Yeah, yeah. How about Greg Abbott as governor? Are you satisfied with Governor Abbott's performance? Uh, I'm satisfied with some things and not with others. And I can tell you, if, no, no matter what the list you're going to give me, I can tell you I'm satisfied with some things and not with others. All right, let me ask you about the Republican Party in the main. Again, once upon a time, you were the most conservative crown in the box. And that was at a time when the party was very different and politics was very different and the state was very different. When you see the Republican Party today, do you see a Republican Party that you believe is doing a good job for the people of the state? When you see the, the internecine feuding that's happening in the party, do you well, think Well, I mean, I think the internecine feuding is a result of being a majority party. And it's the same thing that exists in the Democrat Party, you know, 30 years ago. Because right. when, as that Democrat Party changed, we, we, actually it was the majority party by a large margin at that time. So this is just... This is just natural when you're a majority party. Am I forgetting the time when the Republican yeah. Party? Yeah. Uh, some things I am, some things I'm not. I will tell you one thing I'm not yeah. is that we cannot talk about immigration. And I am, you know, I am absolutely 100 percent for border security by whatever means possible. Uh, you know, it, I don't care if that's a wall, if that's uh, seismic intrusion devices, drone uh, air observation, aerial manned observation, boots on the ground, whatever it takes. But if we continue to dumb it down to just say I have to build a wall you know, from, from Boca Chica to mouth of the Rio Grande to San Ysidro at the mouth of San Diego River in California, build a wall. That's just dumbing it down. Yeah, build a wall in some places. Uh, I, I, I'm concerned about the simplistic rhetoric, not right. necessarily about the goal. I hear you say that when the Democrats uh, were running the state, there were internecine feuds then, and that's, that's certainly true. But remind me which Democratic governor ran ads against Democratic members of the legislature in the primary. I can't remember one. I can't either. Would, do you think that's a good idea? Should your party be going after its own, eating I, its I young? Would, uh, you know, I would make, it would be very exceptional for me to go after, to involve myself in a primary uh, in a, in a, for a House race or a Senate race. It'd be, it, you know, I'm not saying I wouldn't do it, Yeah. but there would need to be a, a, a compelling reason. Have you voted yet? Did you vote yesterday? Uh, I voted, what was the first day? First day of early vote was the 20th, uh, t Tuesday. Okay, yeah, I did. You want to tell us who you voted for? I voted for me. Do you want to tell us who else you voted for? Uh, Governor no. Abbott well, was I'm asking not, the other day. Yeah. You know, I don't want to get it. You know, I voted, I voted for some people. I, so, actually, I skipped, I skipped a race because I couldn't make my mind. In Statewide? It. Uh, uh, yes. No. Well... <laughs> Which, which statewide race did you skip, Commissioner? No, I said, did you hear me say no? No, you did not skip it. Oh. No, no, what I'm saying is, yes. yes, I did skip. No, I'm not going to tell you. No, you're not going to tell me. Um, did you vote for Donald Trump? Uh, I did a write-in for a guy named Evan McMullen. This is the former CIA operative from Utah, mm -hmm. right? Why didn't you vote for President Trump? Uh, I was uh, not a fan of Trump. 
Are you a fan of Trump now? Uh, in some uh, areas, I am. Not, uh, I, I, no, don't yeah. give me any bullshit yeah. here. Yeah. I mean, yeah. to just tell you, yeah. I, I am. I'm extremely happy with his management of the armed forces, which surprises me for a guy that said he's smarter than all the generals, and he apparently realized he's not, and he's given discretion to field commanders to make to make decisions, yeah. and that saves lives. Yeah. And that's real important to me as a son, as a father of, of a marine. Right. Uh, this is an important issue for you. It is important. Yes. So I'm I'm very happy with uh, almost all of his cabinet picks. Mad Dog Mattis, could you find a better Secretary of Defense? And, and did you know that Mad Dog Mattis has a bear rug in his den? The bear's not dead, he's just afraid to move. Okay. I mean, you've got Mad Dog Maddox, you've got a, a bevy of other good appointments, right. and judicial what appointments, are you not I'm extremely happy What are you not happy about? I'm, I'm also happy with yeah. the fact that he's rolling back uh, uh, Obama administrative actions. I'm happy with the fact that he said to, on, on the DACA issue, he dropped it in Congress's lap and said, y'all fix it, because it is their job, it's not the president's job. So, so frankly, I'm happy with far more than I expected to be happy with. What are you with. not happy with? I'm not happy with the, the tweet fest that come, uh, come, that come over him from time to time. And actually, he's kind of abated that. I mean, he's, he doesn't- Seriously, do you've been on Twitter the last 48 hours. <laughs> well, what's, a, what's, a, what's Twitter about? I mean, I mean, what is he doing on Twitter right now? Well, I mean, he's, he's, he was going after on the gun stuff and on he was going oh, after okay. Jeff I don't Sessions. Have, I mean, that, you know. But that's an issue. He's yeah. not going after somebody, some personality. He's not going after, you know, a reporter. He's not I mean, Cr it, Crooked he's H. I mean, he is going after people individually. Well, I don't I don't have I don't get Twitter. So so it's again, it's style points. It's a little bit like the conversation about Dan Patrick. It's more of a style issue. You maybe yeah. disagree with the way he's doing things, but generally you feel pretty good. Yeah, well, but you, I am I yeah. am. Uh, I'm you've come around. You've come around on him. Yeah, uh, because of performance. I mean, uh, we, we got a tax cut bill. How much was that? I mean, according to Kevin Brady, who I talked to last Saturday night, he said that success in a tax cut bill, a substantial amount of the of the credit goes to Donald Trump. Yeah, I mean, it's controversial. We'll see how the tax bill works out. But I hear what well, you're yeah, saying. I yeah, I, 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 I hear what you're saying on it. Uh, before we open it up for questions, I, I cannot sit here in the shadow of the Parkland High School shooting with the state legislator who was more associated with gun rights as an issue than any other without asking you about what's been going on. Turn on CNN yesterday, you got the kids and the families of not only Parkland, but also Columbine and Sandy Hook at the White House with the president. Turn on CNN last night, uh, uh, there's this town hall meeting with Marco Rubio and Ted Deutsch and uh, Bill Nelson uh, on CNN with all these kids from Parkland. Turn on the radio coming in this morning, there are parents of kids who were killed at Parkland on all the news things. I don't know whether this is actually a moment or a movement. I don't think we actually know yet. There is suddenly, though, a conversation about what the, the public response from government should be. We've had this conversation in some fashion for years together, Commissioner. What do you, what, what's your view of this it, in view of what happened? It pains me, I mean, uh... I remember Sandy Hook. I mean, that was just a gut punch to me. I mean, and then actually, Sandy Hook made me think. Is your advocacy, you know, is it well, is it based, is it legitimate, is it the right thing to do? And at the end of the day, I concluded, yes, it is. Uh, There's it, nothing that you felt then and nothing that you feel now that people in office should do. I mean, Marco Rubio. I was, I was getting there. Okay, go, go there, okay. please, yeah. Uh, so the problem with what we have now is. There's this clamor to do something, do something, do something. And here's what's going to happen, or likely happen. We're going to do something that makes no difference. But we'll satisfy the gun control folks. And, and there's blame on both sides. I'm not happy with the NRA. I mean, and I'm not happy with the, you know, the gun control, whatever the moms are. But we will do something like we'll, we'll, uh, we'll extend, we'll, we'll implement waiting periods, or we will ban high capacity magazines or we'll do this or we'll do that or we'll do all this stuff and it will not make a damn bit of difference in reducing these these incidents why not because they are window dressing to make fe make people feel good that's what congress and legislative bodies do i did something about fill in the blank when in fact it makes no difference and if you if you ban high capacity magazines first of all you can't do that there are too damn many of them out there they're not serialized there's no way of determining who owns them if you, ban, if you ban ugly weapons like the AR-15, which does not stand for automatic rifle, it stands for Armalite, the company that designed it. It is not fully automatic. Uh, if you ban those, you know, it, it will not reduce the mass killings. 
I mean, the, the assault weapons ban of 1994, which expired in 2004, was not an assault weapons ban. It was a macho-looking weapons ban. Assault weapons were banned in, two, in 1934 by the National Firearms Act when it eliminated the ability on a fully automatic weapon. There are things to do. And the, the things to do are prim, around my premise, which is politically incorrect, that we do not have a gun problem as much as we have a nut job problem. Well, but I think that's actually become a standard. I mean, it's not a, you're, you're not outside the, the, the mainstream well, the term, on that. The nut job. The, the nut job may be, but the fact is that what what we hear people saying is we have a problem that we have to address through the mental health door and not the gun door. Let me just ask you as a point of fact about five things that have come up, just yes or no. Okay. Do you believe that we should ban high capacity magazines? No. Do you believe that we should ban access to assault weapons, to the AR-15 or the AK? We did. But no, I'm, I know, we did. I'm, yeah, but I'm, I'm asking you be, I'm if not, we should. Not, I'm not taking we, assault weapons were banned in 1934, and then expired. I mean, did you say that? The, no, the, no, no, no. Assault weapons were banned in 1934 by the National Firearms Act, which right. eliminated the right of a citizen to own a fully automatic weapon. Right. 1994 banned weapons based upon their appearance, not functionality. And then that you said that, the, and then that expired in, in 2004. Right. So should we go back to the period that we had between 93 and 2004? No, it didn't do to any limit, good. To no, limit access to, to limit access, whatever AR stands for, we should, we be limit, should we be limiting access to those weapons? No, That's the question. No, the no, whole conversation about no. weapons of war. They're not weapons of war. Right. I've been to war. So you, re and you, so you, you, reject, you, the, you reject the language around semi-automatics. So then we, we're not going to do something on that. Uh, should you expand background checks? Uh, I think uh, I think we need to change the background check system to get the people in there that should are no are are, are uh, prohibited purchasers like the the Sutherland Springs uh, that was a felony conviction that should have been in the database. We need to do improvements to the back to the background check system. Absolutely, should we expand it? And what the problem is is that close the gun show loophole. It's not a gun show loophole. It's a private transaction loophole whereby if I wanted to give my son a shotgun for Christmas, that's a conveyance and it would require a 4473 background check. Should we, should we expand the information in the NICS database and, and make it accurate and make it up to date? Yes. Yes. Uh, how about banning bump stocks? I think bump stocks are a piece of junk, and I don't have a problem with banning them. I just, right. They're a piece of junk. They're symbolic. I mean, I wouldn't have one. Right. Now, finally, and this gets back to your advocacy for legislation in Texas as a state legislator. The uh, president yesterday said in response to discussions with these kids, uh, we ought to be providing um, weapons and training to teachers and to school administrators uh, as a solution to the problem of a bad guy with a gun showing up in a school so that possibly a teacher or administrator could subdue the perpetrator quickly and avoid the negative consequences of an event like this. What do you think about that? We need an armed, competent person at every school, whether it's a teacher, a coach, a principal, whether it's a cop, whether it's a uh, you know, uh, retired military, whatever it is, we need an armed, competent person at every school. And of course, the, the response to that is, you know, somebody with a handgun can't stop right. a guy with an AR, you know, or with high cap magazines. And that's just, they don't understand the tactical situation. The first, here's, the, here's the common denominator in all these mass shootings. There is somebody in total, complete, absolute control in, in getting their jollies com committing mayhem. And when you say, well, you couldn't take him down, he had body armor or whatever, and you just had a, you know, he had your little pipsqueak uh, nine millimeter handgun, you don't have to take him down. You have to change the dynamic. You have to take that person who in Aurora, Colorado, was walking down theater aisles, calmly shooting people in the back of the head. It all changed. The first time you return fire, you've changed the dynamic. That person, the shooter, is no longer completely free to put all of their attention on the victims and they have to respond to you. And so to the people who say, this will be the last thing we can go to questions, so the la uh, to the people who say what you're suggesting is more guns in schools to combat violence, what we need is fewer guns in schools, your response to that is what? That you're, uh, well, you're that adding another... That doesn't even make any sense. But you hear, but more, more guns in schools? We don't have any guns in schools. Or we do have guns in schools in the circumstances that we just saw in, in Florida. the hands of the wrong. That's people, just a false. Right. I mean, I don't, I don't even want to respond to that. that. More guns in schools. That's a talking point of moms demand action. Mm -hmm. It is. Well, it's bullshit. OK. I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, uh, Commissioner, that you won't tell us what you think. <laughs> I wish you would let your hair down occasionally here. Uh, questions from the audience. We'll go for the last couple of minutes. All right, I don't generate a lot have, of interest. Have you, are you, are you just numbed into silence? Okay. No questions for Commissioner Patterson. Ma'am. With all the various agencies, what is the actual 
responsibility of the general land office regarding things to do with the border? And what should they do? Almost nothing. I, I can't think of responsibility for the general land office on anything that has to do with the border. There are, there is some state acreage that would be, that's along the Rio Grande, but it's, I mean, it's minimal, almost none. There is no responsibility for the border with the land office. Right. By, that doesn't mean that any elected official doesn't have a right to say anything he or she wishes. Right, I mean, the reality is, and I, when I interviewed Commissioner Bush when he was running for this office in 2014, there are a whole bunch of things on his website as a campaign uh, website about abortion and about Obamacare and everything else. And in fact, you know, you mentioned a couple of issues today as well that really have nothing at all to do with the portfolio of the land office, but you're free to say whatever you want on any issue, right? That's it. Sir. Good morning. Uh, you spoke briefly about uh, long-term, short-term housing when it comes to emergencies and, and disaster recovery. Can you elaborate on uh, how we might go about, from a state perspective, being able to change the way in which we build to begin with and enhancing our overall resiliency yeah. when it comes to anticipation right. of, of uh, events in the future? Right. Part of the conversation, Commissioner, you know about post-Harvey has been going forward, but part of it is about what do we do wrong going backward and not redo the same mistakes that we made that set yeah. us up for this. We made mistakes in the past, and as far as our construction, that we had no idea were mistakes at the time. I mean, we now know that, you know, every coastal barrier island is moving inland, you know, as a, you know, you have a transgressing sea and a regressing uh, landmass. So, you, you, you know, that's one of the things, coastal construction, uh, construction within 100-year floodplain, and frankly, we have issues with the, I mean, I live in Onion Creek. I had 16 feet of water in my backyard, right. but it would have taken five more to get in my house. Uh, things that we did then were perfectly legitimate, but resiliency in construction, uh, you know, and, and, and having building standards, particularly in coastal and low-lying areas, uh, low areas, we have to do that. We got more data now. We're smarter now. Okay. You're going to have enough money to run this race? Uh, I have more money than I thought I was going to have, but he has have. about 35 times cash on hand. If I'm doing the math right, yeah, I, would, I wouldn't doubt that. But I suspect he's out about a mill in the last month. Yeah, you worried about the Democratic wave coming? Uh, they say uh, the turnout, <laughs> early early vote. Turnout. That's what I don't like about politics. What you know, well, the Democrats, George Soros is going to take over Texas in November. I mean, I just I couldn't put my name on something like that. Yeah. I mean, you know. It's just well, too much. Hy there's hyperbole. Okay. If, if, if we end this conversation, Commissioner, by agreeing that George Soros is not coming to take over Texas, then I'm going to call that a win for both of us. Actually, <laughs> um, please give Commissioner Patterson a big hand. Thank you all for coming. We'll see you. Thank you, man. Thank you for Enjoy being. It. Thank you for being so accessible as always. Well, it's I just a, wish more people were. It's a rare thing these days. Well, I need to arrange more of this. We have a lot of people on the live stream.